third part is going to be whether or not the business method actually promotes more ethical decision making. I, I'm aware that uh, this may be of um, uh, uh, as much interest or more interest than some of the earlier things which I've said. Mm -hmm. I'll try and judge it by the expressions on your faces and the amount of uh, fidgeting that you've uh, done. I don't know how many of you uh, know the uh, practice of actually sticking your hand up, and that's such a learnt social convention, a very powerful social convention, for without making a big racket, drawing people into uh, common action. And so this is an example, perhaps, of the ways that Quakers have invented things uh, in order to... Uh, for want of a better word, engineer social activity so that it's uh, efficient. Okay, so uh, moral decision-making. This is a tricky area, perhaps, because you know, what's morality? Okay. Yeah. It's really very subjective, isn't it? Well, work in cognitive science has actually started to think about what kinds of moral models, what are the mental models that we used to think uh, in situations where you've got to make decisions considered to have moral implications. Uh, so this isn't just P uh, Stephen Pinker's ideas, but he synthesizes it particularly well. So in his book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, what this does is to identify models that we use in order to do reasoning uh, in situations where there's morality. And there are five models. Perhaps the first one isn't a model, it's just the absence of such reasoning. Uh, but then there's tribal, communal, uh, reasoning, uh, authority ranking, equality matching, and rational legal. And all of these words will be familiar to you, but it's the way that they're synthesized together which I think is uh, new. No moral uh, relation model basically says uh, you're a member of a group, um, but there are other people, but you don't treat them as people, they're objects. They're animals, uh, you can use terms to denigrate them, and you can do things um, at worst to killing them or enslaving them because they are not. Um, uh, entities that carry any moral, moral value. Okay? Lowest moral model. Okay? Regrettably, we see too much of it. Next moral model is tribal communal, where you have two groups. Could be two football teams, uh, could be two ethnicities even. It could be uh, one religious group versus another religious group. It could be academics and students. Right? But uh, you uh, high moral relations uh, uh, amongst those people within your group compared with those uh, outside your group. And decisions are made uh, 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 on that basis. So authority ranking, uh, you can think of as, say, a family uh, where their parents are the top, children at the bottom, or this is a, C a CEO of a company, okay? And these are uh, employees down below. And it's rationally organized as a hierarchy because that's a really good way of transmitting information around an organizing structure. Uh, requirement for there to be loyalty uh, going up and some sense of care or prote uh, protection going down. So if you're a, a head of an organization, you're expected to look after uh, the health and safety and well-being of your uh, people in your uh, employ. And also, things can go wrong. If you are a dictator, uh, you will use these structures in order to do things which uh, uh, we wouldn't find acceptable. What kinds of things might we find acceptable? Well, uh, equality matching is the uh, next moral model where everybody uh, gets an equal share of everything. Right? So we're starting to focus not on groups, but on individuals. And so here, there are things like tit-for-tat strategies is what you would use in order to organize behavior. Uh, equally dividing uh, really carefully the number of pieces of cake within a family so that no one gets a, a, a different amount, or everybody doing the same kind of work gets the same kind of pay. The fourth uh, highest level is rational legal models. It requires abstract thinking. And it's things like uh, having voting systems, monetary systems. Of course, uh, many people think that money is the cause of all evil, but money is really very important because what it does is to allow us my needs to differ from your needs and then we can have some basis for negotiating to get my needs satisfied against your needs without everything having to be equal. So changing things and measuring things against money, as imperfect as it is, is more sophisticated than treating everybody uh, as equal. Um, if you can think abstractly, I can imagine that I'm actually one of you. Yeah? And so if I can imagine I'm one of you and by an accident of birth, actually, I'm not a, uh, I wasn't born in a third world country with uh, uh, hardly any education, as an immediate consequence just of simple rationality is I no longer can think that I am better and different and higher and exceptional compared to somebody else 
because I can put myself in their shoes where I'm superior just because I'm me, I'm exceptional because I'm me. No, that's not possible. So I need to think in terms of I'm equal to others. Oh. One of the things that I re really sold this to me is that it maps on to different amounts of information. So uh, it's categorical, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So in terms of uh, inter uh, uh, ordinal, you just have different groups. Yeah? In terms of ratio, you're actually judging things against, in, in proportion to each other against some uh, uh, zero quantity. Right? And so for me, as a scientist, this then buys into all the kinds of so sophisticated models and reasoning that, uh, that you can have. And so uh, you can d describe these in terms of uh, who are the sub uh, subjects uh, of the models and also in kinds of the processes that are going on in order to uh, implement the different models. Right? So this is very powerful because you can, in a particular moral situation, identify which model and what processes are going on. And if you want to object, you then have a rational, objective basis for making moral decisions. I think it's a very powerful argument uh, that no longer uh, do I, uh, as um, uh, a non-theist, have to uh, wave my hands at, well, there are some uh, uh, there, there's some objective criteria for making moral judgments. But uh, cognitive scientists and uh, uh, evolutionary biologists and a whole range of others have uh, basically uh, looked at these processes and as um, uh, cultures mature, as people mature, or as societies mature, uh, you have uh, an ordering of these m uh, models. And so um, uh, many countries that we would say are uh, more... Uh, uh, and better human rights well, countries that we would want to live in are higher up on this spectrum. Okay? Uh, children are down here. Uh, they're very uh, tribal and communal, perhaps, um, in some circumstances. Or they may not even recognize that their, their brother or sister is to today um, to be recognized as having the same, <laughs> same value as them. Moral behavior, then, can be characterized as trying to push individuals or societies up this spectrum also think about um, immoral behavior. So if there's a natural ordering here, what might happen is uh, people might want to try and push, say, authority ranking above the others. So as a dictator, you might uh, push authority ranking so that uh, legal rational aspects of uh, made secondary to similarly with the uh, communal tribal uh, issues. So, so one of the things I think is uh, terrible is any uh, country that will, on the basis of an ethnicity, distinguish people within that population. So there's one country uh, recently uh, uh, introduced uh, having um, uh, the ethnicity put onto passports. And that, of course, led to communal violence because it's easy to, uh, to uh, precisely determine uh, people's um, uh, ethnicity, okay? even though they'd lived together uh, uh, um, contentedly for um, uh, decades. A function of a moral model then also is to work in the opposite way, where there may be forces that naturally are pushing these things upwards. Right? And so perhaps what we want it to do is to use the higher moral models to stop forces which are trying to promote lower moral models. And we can pop up at a further level and say, well, if you're a, a dictator or a rogue state, what you might do is actually use the instruments of legal... Um, um, legal systems or notions of equality, my group is more equal than your group, okay? uh, or changing laws of the country in order to promote these things over uh, others. These are all models that we recognize, but it's then the system upon which you can build that I think is really powerful for thinking. And what we can do is apply this to exactly the same tools which we had earlier on and ask the question, how do they relate to the moral models which you would say are more advanced uh, versus the more primitive? Do they support uh, the ones which are more advanced uh, or perhaps hinder them? Or do they hinder the ones which are more primitive uh, or perhaps which you wouldn't want uh, would actually support the more primitive moral models? Ideally, what we would like is to come up with patterns which look like this, where there's support for the moral models which are the more positive ones and moral models which are the, uh, not support for models which are more primitive. Okay, so this is the basic explanatory scheme which I'm using. Human behavior is really complex, so what I'm going to do is decompose it into does the method actually uh, uh, support uh, more moral decision-making in terms of process, and then also in terms of the decisions that are made or the content 
that it's produced. The, let's take a concrete example first. Um, the configuration where everybody is sat equidistant and uh, equally able to attract the attention of the, uh, the clerk is an example of um, equality matching. So we've got a, um, a, a thin solid line here. Okay? Uh, the clerk is trained to try and allow everybody uh, who uh, wishes to speak to speak rather than excluding one group or, uh, or another. But of course there's a danger uh, in that uh, the a clerk could uh, become an authority figure and be treated as an authority figure. But then again, the, uh, the role of the clerk as a servant of the meeting and the very clear statement that they're a servant of the meeting might mitigate that. And I would invite you to go through, uh, um, through the moral models and, uh, and apply them in this way and see where does it, uh, how does it pan out. If you're thinking about the decisions that are actually made, uh, are they likely to be ones which are related more to the moral models uh, or, uh, or uh, higher moral models or not? Uh, for example, if you're open-minded, we are very mindful, though, uh, that uh, we shouldn't be using that as a special position in which to judge others. And so uh, there's a mitigation of having open-mindedness which then works against tribalism. Okay? Uh, Quakers... Uh, uh, very much against uh, authority. And so in the history of Quakers, the doffing of caps and so forth is um, very much built into the uh, psyche of uh, Quakers. Yeah, but you can make similar kinds of arguments, but with respect to uh, content. Okay? And so the corporate values of uh, Quakerism, but also of uh, many religions, but not all religions, are, are ones which promote uh, rational legal models, uh, notions of justice, okay? uh, but also notions of equality. Uh, try and summarize this. Okay? Uh, by uh, P represents here uh, process, and C stands for whether the content of the decision is one which is likely to be more moral, and green is uh, something which is positive, whereas uh, uh, red is some, uh, something where there perhaps is a clear argument against uh, this tool supporting this um, uh, uh, supporting a good moral model or acting against a, uh, uh, a poor moral model. Uh, there's more of the positives supported by the, the Quaker business method tools than uh, not. This is just a theoretical analysis, as I sa said. For somebody who was so attracted to the moral models because the ethical legal ones were very much based on quantitative analysis and bal balancing weighing different quantities, this is simply just a categorical analysis, right? And really would need um, a, a, a much more d detailed uh, a quantitative analysis to more fully support this. Right? Overall summary, what I've done is to interpret the uh, business method in terms of a set of concrete tools tools which I think that you might be actually able to use in a uh, real business uh, uh, context. I've certainly tried to use them in uh, a university context and uh, it made it a bit easier to chair the meeting I was chairing yesterday, even though was, there were some um, members of uh, faculty who were particularly argumentative. I've used the ideas from cognitive science to try and systematically identify what barriers uh, might happen just because of the way that we are set up uh, as human beings to process information. And the uh, business method uh, tools, uh, to a large extent, I would say, have tried to mitigate those. So this natural exploration over 300 years has, uh, I would say, more than stumbled across, uh, has system uh, more or less systematically explored different uh, options and then uh, 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 set some aside and kept others at work. Um, it's possible, I think, to make moral judgments using the moral models. I'm not saying that it's universal to all possible situations, but it's, uh, I think that it's a very powerful way of um, thinking and making uh, judgments, which uh, in the past you might just have been left saying it's a matter of subjectivity. And it appears that maybe uh, many of the tools of the Quaker business method uh, promote processes that um, uh, are themselves uh, treat people better in the process of decision making, process side, but also perhaps might generate decisions uh, that are more, uh, more moral in the end, not in the least because there are a set of corporate values, a set of uh, values in general, uh, which are aspired to, which going back to the process uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, are in there and feeding into the process all the time, seeding ideas 
uh, which might not otherwise have uh, been thought of. So um, I think now's the time to, well, before we break up the network, is to uh, propose a vote of thanks to Peter for uh, all of the work he's done in preparing for today and indeed delivering to us in such an engaging and entertaining way. Quickly, don't normally chat, but I think we can today. <laughs>